Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You were the reason why this content remains just too expensive. It's too expensive. Okay, it's too, uh, that's usually the reason why we don't get nice things. And today, we're going to talk about things that are, well, probably were just too expensive. Five more of the craziest never-built airplanes. The Aracon-1.6 Wingship. I'm just going to call it the Aracon, because that's a name. This, um, well, aircraft sort of deal really only barely counts as a proper airplane because it really isn't it's a ground effect vehicle but uh, on what other list am i ever going to put this thing but it still counts as a fixed wing craft some people call them acronoplanes you're probably familiar with the caspian sea monster the soviets built that thing was enormous and the united states also looked into the possibility of utilizing ground effect vehicle for multiple different purposes cargo transport, military roles, and possibly for passenger service. The thing about ground effect vehicles is that they can transport anything over very long distances at near aircraft speeds, but with a lot better efficiency. Their fuel consumption, for example, is usually lower than a traditional jet that would have to get well up into the sky. Ground effect vehicles stay in what's called the ground effect, which is the aerodynamic interaction between the moving wing and the surface below it. As a result, they fly, but only just above a surface, usually water. Because you can do it over land, but you really shouldn't. There's a lot more things to hit, like the ground. This concept aircraft would have weighed 5,000 tons, but been able to carry about 1,400 tons worth of cargo, as well as 2,000 passengers a distance of 11,500 miles. That's 8,500 kilometers at speeds that would have been around the same of a traditional aircraft. DARPA actually looked into it, evaluating the design alongside other manufacturer proposals, as part of a preliminary study into the concept in general during the 1990s. They wanted to see if a billion dollar program was necessarily viable. And thank you, thank you for checking. Actually, I appreciate that you're actually looking into whether or not it's a good idea before you throw a billion dollars out there. I mean, I know we have it, but we shouldn't just throw it out willy-nilly, is what I'm trying to say. But by the end of 1994, the Department of Defense decided the design was just too risky and didn't offer any further funding for it. Ground effect vehicles have similar weaknesses to that of hovercrafts. They're both very fast and sometimes more efficient than traditional planes, but they're also at the mercy of the water. A ground effect vehicle needs the seas to be pretty calm, and they also can't turn very well. They also generally can't maintain proper flight. So in an emergency, they can't pull up. They would have to land back down in the water. And in a storm, that's a, that's not good. That's a, that's probably bad. And that's the reason why ground effect vehicles to date still haven't been used in any real capacities. Not significantly anyway. The Conroy Virtus. What the heck is that thing supposed to be? That's, oh, that's the space shuttle. Oh, okay, so understand this thing was huge. This proposed design was submitted in 1974 by John M. Conroy of the Turbo 3 Corporation. It was to utilize two Boeing B-52 Stratofortress fuselages to form a completely new aircraft using existing parts as a cost-saving measure. What possible purpose was this for? Why would we need an aircraft that large? Well, it was seriously considered because, well, there's a reason the space shuttle's in the picture. This thing was supposed to move the space shuttle. That was the intention. They needed a very large aircraft specifically to move the space shuttle around. You're probably well aware that they wound up using a modified 747 with the space shuttle on top of it to move it around instead. But before that, the Virtus was considered. Back then, the space shuttle was actually originally designed to use turbofan engines for propulsion within the atmosphere on re-entry, rather than just gliding effectively, which is what it actually wound up doing. With that configuration, it could have taken off from a regular runway and moved itself around normally, without the need to be carried by a larger aircraft. But when those plans were altered due to cost and weight concerns, they needed something to move it. 
John M. Conroy, by the way, was the one who developed the Pregnant Guppy and the Super Guppy, two crazy but successful aircraft that NASA had found significant use with. Virtus is what he came up with, and it was expected to cost, at the time, $12.5 million each. That's a little over $52 million in today's money. The design called for four large jet engines, which were intended to be the Pratt & Whitney JT-9D, which were used for the Boeing 747. As I said before, Conroy's design took into account using a lot of pre-existing components to try to keep cost at an absolute minimum, which might explain why he estimated the rather low price tag. The shuttle would be carried underneath the center section of the aircraft's wing, between the fuselages, and it was large enough that it could also carry other things associated with the shuttle, like the external tank or the solid rocket boosters. The design did get as far as wind tunnel tests, which were pretty promising, but there were significant drawbacks with it. Even though it was designed to be as cheap as possible because of the off-the-shelf components, it was still going to be expensive. Just the development costs alone for a new aircraft were going to be pretty high, and they knew that. Flight tests would have to be done, and that would take up a lot of time, and the sheer size of it would mean that they would need to expand infrastructure in order to support it at all. Conroy did not give up on the Virtus, though. He actually proposed a commercial version of the design, which he named Colossus, but it attracted no interest, probably for the same reasons I already mentioned. It's just too big, you'd have to redesign the airports around this specific aircraft, and no one wanted to absorb the tremendous cost of doing that. Though I admit, it would have been cool. The Boeing 2707. What the heck is that? That looks... Wait a minute. Yep, this was the chosen design for the American supersonic airliner. During the 1960s, every major country was trying to build a supersonic airliner. Only the Soviets, as well as the combination of the UK and France, wound up completing the project. But as you might imagine, America certainly wasn't willing to be left out of this because we have to be better than everybody else at absolutely everything. It's a rule that we stick to, except when we don't. But we don't talk about when we don't because this is the land of the free. And at the time, we were pushing to develop our own supersonic airliner. Boeing won the contract and began development at its facilities in Seattle, Washington. They were actually in the process of completing two prototypes when the whole thing was cancelled in 1971. But why? Well, the initial design actually called for a swing wing design, but that would have been really expensive. The required weight and size of that mechanism caused a lot of hiccups with the project, so they had to go with a more conservative delta wing design. Still, it could have worked. After all, the Concorde wound up pretty good, all things considered. But there were other issues with supersonic airliners, that were causing concerns. See, one of the biggest problems with supersonic is the sonic boom. Aircraft that break the sound barrier cause a tremendously loud boom that can be heard for miles. Military aircraft get away with this, but for a commercial airline that's going to be generally flying over civilian territory a lot more often, that can start to get annoying. The Concorde wound up restricted to only flying over water for the most part. Even though the 2707 could have made the trip between New York and Los Angeles in a vastly, vastly shorter amount of time than a conventional plane, it never would have been allowed to because of noise complaints. There was also political issues surrounding it, mostly that the project was, of course, violently expensive, and many politicians said that it was frivolous federal spending. Which, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this is frivolous spending? Look, I live here, I know what you spend money on. This wasn't that frivolous. You shush, go back to arguing about something mundane, please. Either way, the funding wound up being cancelled, and without that, Boeing, of course, couldn't actually complete it. The prototypes that were in progress wound up being scrapped. And due to the loss of the contract, as well as a few others, it caused a significant hit to the American economy in the area. Boeing had to reduce its employees by more than 60,000, and the 2707 became known as the airplane that almost ate Seattle, due to the mass layoffs and so many people moving away from the city, trying to find work. You know, people on Facebook and Twitter always argue, why are we spending so much money on this project or this project? I mean, it's not really helping us, why aren't we helping us? But do you have any idea? 
how many people have jobs because of ridiculous nonsense like this. Like, the advancement of technology is a job creator. Thousands, tens of thousands, possibly millions of people in the supply chain depend on it for their own financial security. And whenever cuts like this happen, sometimes it makes sense to do it, but it hurts people. And no one really thinks about that. And Boeing was really pushing the envelope. A lot of the design proposals in the original draft are actually kind of standard now, such as the glass cockpit it was supposed to use, as well as the super critical wing. Though the prototypes were scrapped, the mock-up they built was actually sold to a museum. In early 2013, it was finally moved back to Seattle, where it's undergoing restoration at the Museum of Flight. The DFW-R3. Now, this probably doesn't look like much to a lot of you, but I need to, I need to clarify a few things about this. DFW stands for Deutsch Flunzing Werk. They were a German aircraft manufacturer of the early 20th century. This was a World War I aircraft, and it was designed to be a bomber. It was very, very similar to its preceding cousins, the R1 and the R2. But the reason why the R3 in particular is very notable as a thing that might have been built is how large it was supposed to be. Mind you, it was 1918. Planes were still in their infancy, and large planes, very large planes like we have now, and are rather commonplace all things considered, were pretty much unheard of. The reason I bring this up is this thing's wingspan was supposed to be 53.5 meters. That's 175 feet 6 inches. What? In 1918? Are you sure? Just for reference and clarification as to how big this thing would have been, the B-52H has a wingspan of 185 feet, 0 inches. That's 56.4 meters. The R3 would have had a wingspan only 10 feet shorter than the modern version of a B-52. In 1918! How was this thing ever going to get off the ground? Oh, you know, with eight engines. Each one would have been 260 horsepower, Mercedes D4s. But this thing wound up never actually being built, because, yo, no. Given how big it was supposed to be, coupled with the power output of the engines, I feel like most of their power would be used just to get this behemoth in the air. I'm not sure how much ordnance it really could have carried as a bomber. The R2, the predecessor to this thing, was also pretty big, though not nearly this massive, and it was unsuitable for combat. They didn't use it for that purpose. That being said, I kind of still would like to have seen a picture of a completed version of this thing, just to say, look, it was the year 1918, and they were just 10 feet short of a B-52. Why? The Victory Bomber! What a nice, positive, ally name. And yes, that's uh, pretty accurate. This was a British concept during the Second World War. It was proposed by British inventor and aircraft designer Barnes Wallace while he was working at Vickers Armstrong. It was meant to be a large, very large, strategic bomber. And it was pretty ambitious for the 40s. It was supposed to have a wingspan of 172 feet, 52 meters, and it would have weighed over 100,000 pounds. It would be powered by six engines, and was designed very specifically to hit a speed of 352 miles per hour, 566 kilometers per hour, and have a maximum altitude of 45,000 feet. This was not meant to be a general all-purpose bomber. They wanted it to carry an earthquake bomb, a 22,000 pound earthquake bomb, to hit strategic targets in Germany. What the heck is an earthquake bomb? Well, to put it simply, it's kind of the ancestor of modern bunker buster bombs. Earthquake bombs were designed to fall from a great height so they could hit terminal velocity and puncture into the ground below, or the reinforced structure, and explode inside of it, rather than just exploding on impact. The concept was still in its infancy at the time, though it had been proven to be somewhat effective in certain applications. They're also sometimes called seismic bombs. 
But this bomb would have been way larger than any of the other earthquake bombs that were being developed and used at the time. And the RAF didn't have anything that could carry a bomb that weighed that much, nor did they have anything that could fly that high. Hence why the Victory Bomber was proposed, a unique aircraft that could meet the needs of this very powerful weapon. But it was rejected. Not because it wouldn't have worked. It may have. And it would have been interesting to see what the British came up with in the end. But even by design, it had some issues. For one thing, with technology that was available at the time, bombing from extremely high altitude just couldn't be accurate. And it's a little pointless to drop a bomb on a reinforced structure if it misses it. The idea was considered and studied greatly, even reaching wind tunnel tests, while the bomb itself was also being tested on representative models. But the Air Ministry decided not to proceed with it, terminating it in May of 1941. No prototypes of it would be built. Simply put, it didn't seem reasonable, especially at the time, to spend a great deal of money, time, and resources building a ginormous bomber just to carry one specific bomb. No matter how powerful the earthquake bomb may have been, building a bomber just for it didn't seem reasonable to the British Air Ministry at that point. Could it have been altered to carry other things? Sure. But the problem there was, how worth it is it for that earthquake bomb when they could just put more time and resources into building more Avro Lancasters? The Lancasters could drop more conventional bombs and do it pretty effectively. And they could also drop other smaller earthquake bombs like the Tall Boy, the Grand Slam, and the Bouncing Bomb. So if the Lancaster was already so flexible, why would they waste so much stuff for just a giant version of all that? It didn't make sense for them back then, and the thing was never built. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 132, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian Pretzer, Twin Fox, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual fond farewell.